the bad news for public market investors is that venture capital and the world of private investing is spreading enormously. I'm not certain about the future of lab-grown meat, driverless vehicles. I mean, this is a huge disruption to the labor market. Welcome to The Conversation, where a big-name guest gives their opinion on the financial questions of the day. The interviewee is not connected with Capital.com, and any views they have are personal to them, and there are alternative perspectives. Their views are not representative of Capital.com, nor do they constitute advice. I think that technology has reached a moment of maturation, where the cutting-edge science has advanced so much uh, that you can now commercialize it, right? And when you've got those fundamental science breakthroughs, what's going to happen, and it's happening already, is that startups with relatively small teams of AI scientists, like 15, 20 people, can take those big open source projects and they can kind of build a thin layer of software on top of the open source uh, public AI. And the thin layer is going to take that public you know, commodity and essentially customize it for a big corporate client like JP Morgan or what have you. That is a super hot area um, of, of adapting open source AI to corporate uses. It's not just a technology question, it's a regulatory question and a sort of social question. You know, what, are, what is society willing to accept? Because obviously driverless vehicles implies a massive number of uh, job displacements, taxi drivers, lorry drivers, etc. I mean, this is a huge disruption to the labor market and you, you can bet that there will be political and social resistance to that. So that's one kind of resistance. Then there's the safety thing. And, you know, even if driverless cars might get to a point where they are actually safer than human drivers, um, people are less tolerant of, of robots when they make mistakes than they are of people. Uh, it's just the fear of the new. The way I predict that this is going to pan out is that I think China is going to be more aggressive about rolling it out. And once China does it, then the West is going to say, oh, you know, wow, you know, we're going to be left behind. And I think then the debate will change. I would guess that in the next 10 to 15 years, we see quite widespread deployment in, in bits of China. They're going to do test. And then once that works, then I think you're going to see it come to the US and Europe. So the interesting thing about clean tech in Silicon Valley is that it had a full dawn coming off uh, partly 9-11 uh, and the sense that you know Arab states supplying energy were geopolitically risky uh, and that by buying oil you were essentially funding terrorism. That was kind of the narrative in, in the US. Uh, and therefore that, on top of the climate concerns, which existed already back then as well, uh, gave a fresh impetus towards thinking about how you could substitute away from carbon fuels. And so there was a big wave of anticipatory venture capital investment uh, into clean tech, and that either failed or it paid off on such a long time scale that it kind of failed as well. And I think finally now, um, with you know heightened concern about climate, you know finally people are taking it seriously. There's a new wave of uh, big interest in clean tech. Some of the technologies that were experimented with in the first wave didn't pay off commercially, but at least there was progress in how you do solar, how you do wind, how you do uh, new kinds of battery. And so now I think industry is moving into it in a bigger way. It's paying off much better. The technology of discovering new drugs uh, was one of extreme excitement at the end of the 1970s. And although it works sometimes with some companies, essentially the standout fact was that it was less profitable than doing IT. IT and software in particular had faster payoff times, you know, drug discovery has to be, you know, taken through stage one, stage two, stage three clinical trials. That's incredibly expensive. And so the regulatory burden on, on the biotech sector 
always made it less profitable than IT was. Now I think we're at a really interesting moment where the whole sort of area of medical technology may be coming back, may be a new rival uh, to IT, partly because IT has matured, so much has been done with software that maybe it'll be um, slowing down a little bit, but also because you've had these breakthrough fundamental technologies. The first one was uh, just the ability to sequence the genome. Then secondly, the ability to sequence the genome super cheaply. And then you've got, on top of the cheap sequencing, you've got the gene editing, that's CRISPR-Cas. Uh, so that's a, a breakthrough. And then you've got the ability to manipulate mRNA. And on top of that, I would add one more, which is you know, artificial intelligence has cracked the code for uh, protein shapes. It's now possible to take the amino acid uh, which is in the protein, if you know the genetic code in the amino acid, you can predict the shape of the protein once it's folded. And that is revolutionary. It used to take a PhD scientist uh, four years or five years to figure out the shape of a protein so that you could design a drug that would bind on top of that shape. And now uh, you just look at the code and you basically do the equivalent of a Google search and the AI will tell you uh, what the shape will be. So it's just, it's saving you four or five years in the drug discovery uh, process. So I think all those things add up to a situation where you could be at a, at a revolution in how many medicines can be discovered. I'm not certain about the future of lab-grown meat. I tend to be a technology optimist, so I kind of think that you know, I'll, I'll expect it probably will work at some point, um, but that's just a guess. But what I would say if we broaden the frame a tiny bit is that food tech more generally clearly uh, is making progress and impossible foods, not impossible meat, you know, is this, this plant-based hamburger thing. And that is an unbelievable story. I think it's got a long way to run because, you know, creating um, a sort of facsimile of hamburgers is one thing. But then think of all the different kinds of meat that you could copy. Think of how much that could be rolled out, because I mean, it's available in some places, but I think the price point is gonna come down as they scale up and the technology matures. And so I think it's gonna be, you know, eaten by a lot more people in the world uh, on, a, on the next 10 or 20 years. The bad news for public market investors is that venture capital and the world of private investing is spreading enormously. And it's spreading, importantly, along the life cycle of companies. So the Amazons of today are not going public at $400 million market cap. They're becoming unicorns, which is where you're worth 10 billion. And then they're becoming Decca unicorns and they're staying private. So take Stripe as a you know FinTech leader, founded, I think, around 2010 or so. Uh, and, you know, 12 years later, you know, it hit a valuation of, I think, 100 billion at one point. It's now probably down to 50 uh, billion, but it's still private, right? So that's bad news uh, for public market investors. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this film useful. Make sure you hit like and subscribe to stay tuned for more films just like this one.